Welcome everybody to Hamilton House, headquarters of the National Education Union. Um, just a bit of housekeeping quickly. The toilets are through the double doors at the back and turn left and then you'll see the signs to them, okay? Um, I'm Jenny Cooper, um, one of the members of the NEU executive and chair of the union's National Health and Safety Organising Forum, which organises around health, safety and the environment. And I'm also a serving teacher in a London school. And as such, I'm standing here today representing both educators and the children and young people in our schools who sadly don't often enough have their voices heard, particularly, I believe, on climate change. As a union, we've got many members who are engaged around climate change, both from the points of view of mitigation and adaptation, demanding quality climate education in our schools, school buildings that are resilient to flood and extreme heat, and justice for our members when they're affected by those kind of changes. We've got a climate network that's formed from grassroots activists, and many of those people are also members of organisations like Friends of the Earth, Extinction Rebellion, Greenpeace, as well as RSPB, the Ministry of Eco-Education, and many more organisations. Our members strike over safety, they campaign over buildings, they march and protest, and increasingly, they take direct action by teaching the things that they know they should teach in their own classrooms when the doors shut. The National Education Union believes that all children and young people should be taught about climate change, its causes and effects, and that this should not just be about science or geography, but it should be mainstreamed across all areas of school life. And we believe that children need to be immersed in nature itself in, in order to discover what it is that we need to protect. And because fair access to nature is in itself an equalities and social justice issue. We also believe in the sustainability and importance of education, that education should not be interrupted when a crisis happens, like a pandemic, flood, fire, or heat wave. But for this to happen, those in authority need to have proper dialogue with us, the stakeholders, to discover how this can be done, how to retrofit, how to make our school estate resilient, how to adapt our curriculum to changing times, and how to ensure the workforce is supported for one of what we believe is one of the most important roles in society. But we're a union, and as a union, we believe the strongest action is that which is taken collectively. In our current society here, and in the global context internationally, we're all aware of the power and control that's held by those that seek to continue to exploit the Earth's precious resources, including its people, for personal gain and greed. Trade unions exist to redress that power imbalance, and by taking action collectively and alongside other groups, we can stop the worst excesses and demand a fairer and safer world for our members, for our children and young people, for the marginalised, for those with whom we stand in solidarity across the global south, and ultimately for nature itself, of which we are, of course, a part. And this is why we're so happy to be hosting this evening's event with such an esteemed panel of speakers. Thank you to all of you for being here. I first met Mitzi at COP27, I think, in Sharm El Sheikh. And that was the COP where I heard for the first time the stories from the Philippines and elsewhere of cyclones and other extreme weather events that were damaging and interrupting education. I heard inspiring stories of schools being used as safe havens during these times of crisis and stories of people coming together to protect people because it was the right thing to do. Mitzi's childhood and youth, though, should not have had to be dominated by a campaign against fossil fuels. This has been a political choice of the drillers and the choppers and the polluters. Young people's futures, and yes, their presence, have been stolen from them through corruption and cover-ups over decades for profit. And they've been left in the unenviable position of being left to sound the alarm while others chatter and fiddle while Rome burns, so to speak. 
The Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which I heard about last year at COP, is one of the best initiatives, I think, to come out of international climate campaigning. It's positive, it brings hope, it's a realistic concrete proposal which is already endorsed by governments, local governments, city mayors, trade unions and others. I'm tonight calling on my union to sign up to this treaty and get behind the one campaign left which has the power to keep us facing a livable future for all in a way that complicated COP texts and bureaucratic government targets offsetting and tech will not. As has been said often before, they will not save us. It's down to us to save ourselves. So everybody here tonight, let's be part of a movement and targeted campaign that grows so big it cannot be ignored by any chancellor's red box. So <laughs> without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Michelle, who's going to chair this evening. And we really look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you so much to everyone for coming tonight. Thank you to Jenny for that fantastic opening to this event. Um, we do seem to be slightly short of mics on the top table. I assume you can all hear me okay from this corner. There's a mic behind the laptop. Is that better? Fantastic. So yes, thank you to Jenny for that introduction and thank you, of course, to the NEU, the Global Justice Now movement, the Stop Rosebank, Fossil Free London for organising this important and exciting event. And thank you all for giving up your time to be here this evening, not least because of the clocks changing, meaning it feels like an awful lot later for an awful lot of us, although I'm probably just showing my age there. And I'm very glad that it's this week and not next week when we might not have been able to make it because of the strikes, because of those pesky unions. But um, I'm Michelle Singleton, and I'm the lead policy officer for climate change in Unison, the public service union. And I have to put a plug in to say that we're the largest trade union and we're 80% women, which we're very proud of as well. And I'm very privileged to chair this meeting today. Unison has a very long and proud history of supporting the climate change movement. It started from the partner unions that formed Unison, so pre-1993, but I think probably the first event that uh, we talk about is the support for um, the UN talks in 1995, which are now regarded as the first COP talks and next year marks the 30 year anniversary of that first meeting. And since then, uh, we've been privileged to attend the last eight of uh, uh, COP meetings and uh, the last two, well, the last year and this year coming with uh, our good friend Jenny, who you've heard from just now. So. Um, We've long recognised that climate change will adversely affect all workers, their families and their communities, but as a public service union, it's also often our members who are at the front line of picking up the pieces of the direct impacts of climate change being felt across the UK, and that's only set to get worse. So that's from the environment agency workers, who are our members dealing with the floods, droughts and polluted rivers, or in the NHS, where the additional burden of the health impacts of increased pollution or extreme weather are keenly felt and often affect the most disadvantaged in our communities, as we know. So the sheer scale of the transformation required in public services alone to meet the government's climate change commitments is huge, and we're clear that workers and communities need to be central to that transition and those plans. But the scale of transformation globally is even more profound. And at the core is our relationship with fossil fuels, which is why we're here tonight. So I'm proud to say that Unison has recently signed up to the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. The fossil fuel industry, as you would have seen in the literature around this event, is threatening global futures and making record profits doing it, as Jenny related to. And uh, the calls for the Non-Proliferation Treaty are gaining ground, um, and that's good to see. So today's discussion is about how we can challenge plans for damaging new fossil fuel projects around the world, and how a fossil fuel treaty could help us win a globally just transition. So I'd like to welcome our speakers uh, and introduce them this evening. We have Izzy McIntosh, the Climate Cam Campaign Manager from Climate Justice Now. We have Rachel Maskell, MP for York Central. We have Irene Vallez Torres, Colombian Consul General in London and former Minister of Mines and Energy in Colombia. And we have Mitzi Janelle Tan, full time climate activist based in the Philippines and a member of the Fossil Fuel Non Proliferation Treaty Steering Group. 
and I will introduce each one a little more in depth ahead of them speaking and there'll be an opportunity to ask questions uh, of the panel after the speakers have finished so do make note make notes of any questions that you have along the way and anything you want to ask but to start off I'll be handing you over to Izzy uh, who is the, as we've mentioned the climate campaign manager at Global Justice Now she leads on global justice campaigning for the global fossil fuel treaty and shapes global justice now's demands for climate justice more broadly before joining GJN she was a migrant justice campaigner focusing on challenging immigration detention and deportations and this includes being part of the team that campaigned to bring the first legal challenge against the previous government's Rwanda deportations policy. But today he's going to talk to us about the treaty and the UK political context. Great, thanks so much Michelle. Can, can you all hear me okay? Okay, cool. So um, thanks so much for being here tonight, everyone. I am going to tell you a bit about the Fossil Fuel Treaty, what it is and why Global Justice Now thinks it's such an important campaign. So I'll take it as read that we all agree that we need a fossil fuel phase out and we need it really urgently because the climate crisis is here and we now really need to focus on what we can do to limit the damage because there is still so much that we can do to limit the damage. Um, but it's going to require a fundamental rewiring of the global economy because right now, big business and money is essentially allowed to do what it wants and cause whatever damage it wants as long as it is still making profit. So, you know, one ex the climate crisis is a really potent example of this. And just today, Shell announced its uh, quarterly profits. And we calculated that between them, Shell and BP have made more profit over the last year than the GDP of the combined GDP of five, the world's five most climate vulnerable countries. So that's just an example of how billions and billions in profit is prioritised over, you know, making basically our entire ecosystem collapse. Um, that's just collateral damage for some people to make money. And some people have made a lot of money from this. <laughs> but the rest of us are left with this existential crisis and this huge fight on our hands. So we have to face down the fossil fuel industry if we're gonna have a hope of dealing with the climate crisis and building a fairer world. And that's what the fossil fuel treaty is seeking to do. It's building a coalition of the willing, not just governments, but also people in all sorts of communities and institutions. I mean, Unison and the union movement being one example of it that will face down the fossil fuel industry and demand a globally just transition and an exit plan from fossil fuels. And this is this demand for a treaty. This is a demand for a treaty built around three pillars. So the pillars are a fossil, an end to fossil fuel expansion, a fair phase out of existing fossil fuel use and a globally just transition to renewable energy. And it's been spearheaded by some of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world, including Pacific Island states like Tuvalu and Vanuatu. And I think for these countries, the climate crisis is obviously urgently existential. So if they're using their limited time to prioritise this as one of their demands, I think it's something that we all really need to be paying attention to. And I also think it shows the potential for this treaty to create a fair transition, because that's really key for climate vulnerable countries. And more broadly as well, this is, we're talking about a, a huge task that needs buy-in from every level of society. So we need to be able to convince people that this is going to be a fair transition and to have a plan to make that so. Um, and for countries, climate vulnerable countries in the global south, what that means is that we need to be providing finance for this transition. Firstly, for the loss and damage that uh, climate vulnerable countries in the global south have already sustained from the climate crisis because this is a climate crisis primarily caused by emissions in the global north so it's right that we think about how we finance that uh, finance loss and damage for those countries and also finance for countries to uh, divert from their economic dependence on fossil fuels because many countries in the global south with smaller economies are quite dependent on fossil fuels when they say a global addiction they don't they, they mean because it's very difficult to get some economies off it. But that is, countries like the UK have a duty to be providing finance for that process. And the way to release a lot of that finance is to tax polluters, to tax these massive polluting corporations and the fossil fuel industry, and in doing so, dismantle its power. 
Um, and that's going to be really necessary for persuading some countries to come on board. We don't need all countries to make this treaty a success, but also for allowing countries in the global, some countries in the global south to transition effectively. Um, as I said, this is a mammoth task. It needs support from all levels of society. And that's what's so great about the fossil fuel treaty as a campaign, is it gives all of us an opportunity and an umbrella, a banner, to build that support under in whatever community we are a part of. And so that's why we really need all of you involved in this campaign. There's loads of ways that you can get involved in it. Um, you can, if you're part of a trade union, you can get motions passed in your trade union branch. If you're part of a university, you can push for your university to endorse it or your local student union. Um, in your place of worship, you can drum up support for it. There's so many different camps where you can do that. And already that process is making headway. There's 14 countries that support the fossil fuel treaty, including Colombia, really significantly as a fossil fuel exporting country. And there's also over 100 cities and subnational governments, hundreds of parliamentarians, scientists, the World Health Organization, people from so many different camps coming together to say this is a good idea. And in terms of the most important things that you can all do. You can talk to your MPs about the Fossil Fuel Treaty and get them to sign up to support it. Rachel has put down an EDM in support of the Fossil Fuel Treaty, so any, ED, uh, any MPs can now sign that. Sorry, an EDM is a parliamentary petition. Um, so if you go to your MP to ask them about it, they will, they will know what it is and they'll be able to sign up to it. So that's one way, and we also need lots of local councils supporting the fossil fuel treaty because that's how we're going to create pressure on the government and create noise around it. We've already got cities supporting the fossil fuel treaty in the UK, including London, Birmingham and Brighton, but we want local councils. The endorsement of London came from Sadiq Khan and we want local councils in London supporting the fossil fuel treaty as well because these are Labour councils and this is something that would make the government take notice of it if there was a big wave of those endorsements. So if you want to get involved in that work, please speak to my colleagues at the back. They've got lovely Global Justice Now t-shirts on and they can, so you can spot them very easily and you can tell, they can tell you all about how you can get involved in that side of our work. And I also have to say that... Um, if you would like to join Global Justice Now, that would be hugely valuable to our work. Monthly donations help us remain independent and therefore allow us to be as radical as we can possibly be. So please, if you can, consider joining. Again, you can talk to my colleagues at the back about that. And the hard sell today is that you will get a free book if you sign up today. So there'll be lots of great reading material for you as well as being a part of our movement. Um, I'll leave you with a quote from Gustavo Petro when he endorsed the Fossil Fuel Treaty at COP28 in Dubai. He said, today we face an immense confrontation between fossil capital and human life, and we must choose a side. Any human being knows that we must choose life. I have no doubt which position to take. Between fossil capital and life, we choose life. Thank you. Thank you, fantastically inspiring start to why we're here this evening and uh, a great lead on to um, Rachel uh, who was elected to Parliament in 2015. She formerly worked for the NHS and is a committed trade unionist. She regularly makes a case for advancing workers rights and also speaks on issues including the economy and the environment and climate. Um, earlier this year, as you heard earlier, Rachel tabled a parliamentary motion in support of the Fossil Fuel Treaty, which has been supported by other Labour MPs, as well as MPs from the SNP, Green Party, Plaid Cymru, and many more. And I'll pass over to her now to talk a little bit more about it. Thank you so much. And can I say a huge thanks to the NEU for hosting this evening and all the work that Global Justice Now do on this issue and so many more. It's really inspiring. On the 5th of July, we had a chance to save the planet. It felt lost within the UK government, and certainly when we saw the previous King's speech endorsing the financing of Rosebank, we felt all hope had gone. But I was absolutely delighted that we have got uh, elected a Labour government and someone so committed as Ed Miliband to try and advance the agenda. And the reason why I have hope is because government has not had this agenda 
for 14 years and we now have an opportunity. And I'm not saying that the government has gone as far as I would like, and I'm sure you appreciate that, but we have got an opportunity and we didn't have that before. And what I have challenged this government with is that it isn't there just to provide national leadership, but global leadership, because there are so many countries, particularly from the global south, which are now speaking so loudly so articulately about the challenges our climate is facing that we now have to level with them to take um, a, a step forward. And whilst the, the work that Ed did when he was last in power in bringing the Climate Change Act, the first of its kind in the world, was the first step, we've now had that long period where nothing has move forward, in fact, things have regressed. And that's why we are absolutely committed now to putting that pressure in Parliament, on government, to ensure that we now uh, see that movement that we must um, see. And I work very closely with my colleagues like Clive Lewis, who um, really does champion the climate as well, to try and, and, and see that we take, make the most of every single moment in, in taking this agenda forward. Now, my first challenge for you is how many people have actually signed up. Only 15 MPs have actually signed up to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It is my guess that in the room that there will be more than 15 constituencies represented. So my first challenge is you've got some work to do out there. A constituent of mine came to me, Mr Bennett. He came and visited my surgery with a little A5 flyer and said, you have got to sign up to this treaty. So I took that away, I did my homework, and um, my signature went on the treaty. So it's as easy as that. Booking an appointment with your MP with a little flyer um, can make all the difference. But I didn't stop there because I realized when reading about the treaty that this was a real game changer. And that's why I took that into Parliament and wrote an a early day motion so that my colleagues can show their solidarity as well. And of course, it doesn't stop there. So we gather signatures, then we write to ministers, and then we have the conversation. And of course, we can now walk through doors and have those conversations. And that's a really important difference, I note, is that you can actually have the grown-up conversation with ministers about what's happening. And that's kind of the next step we've got in Parliament to ensure that they are focused on what we need to be focused on. We're waiting until they return from COP29 because we, I think it's going to be really important that when they're um, there that they're listening to all of the conversations, that they're brought up to speed with what is happening across our planet, the stresses and the strains, the floods and the famines, the, the droughts which so many people are experiencing. And then they come back refreshed to realise that they've got power for that change. And that's when the pressure of Westminster has got to get geared up. That's only in 22 days' time do they return. So we've got our work to do, but that means you've got your work to do too in the intervening period. We need to put pressure on our Chancellor to ensure that she is allocating the funding we need. The commitments keep being made but certainly it's woefully short of where we need to get to. We know that the UN analysis is saying that we need $600 billion a year to be able to address the, the climate differentiation that um, is being faced, to put that mitigation in place, to put the um, protection in place around countries, and to ensure that people are taking a different choice around their energy in the future. But the financial agreement is just $100 billion. So it's a sixth of what it needs to be. So there is work to be done in that area. And we need to ensure that there are ambitious sectoral targets which are going to be set to ensure that they build the resilience across every sector and every um, section of society. And we need to see that just transition we need to tell people, and I'm glad the trade unions are moving on this as well, that this is about good jobs for the future, away from the, the oil and coal and, and gas industry and into the renewable industries and mitigation industries. So there is so much more that can be done. Across the world, we now have 700 parliamentarians who have signed up to the treaty. And I think that is really, really positive, coming 
right from um, different nations, but we need more. If you think there's only 650 MPs in our parliament, we most definitely need more. So um, we've got our job of work to do there. But um, what we must also look at now is how we have a rapid phasing out of existing fossil fuel. And I think um, in putting forward Great British Energy, as we voted on just recently, this week, it gives us a, a framework through which we can now really charge forward in putting that renewable sector together. We want to um, ensure that we um, decarbonise our grid by 2030. Everyone says it can't be done. And I don't have a problem if we don't meet the ambition. What I have a problem with is when governments don't have the ambition in the first place. So we must do everything to help the government to get over that line, to show that it can be done with great speed. The other case we need to make on the economics of this is that the longer we leave it, the more it's going to cost. So we have to act now. When we look at that curve of opportunity to bring about change, it's getting steeper and steeper as we reach that crisis when 1.5 when 1 degrees C will be irreversible. So time is not on our side, and that's why the pressure is needed at this point. The final thing that I just want to, to mention is next year, it's COP30. It's the key COP. It's the one where all the agreements are going to be reviewed. Every country is going to have to resubmit. It is the most important conference of a generation. Because if we don't get it right then, it's going to be too late. And that's why we've got a year to get our government in shape, to get our parliament in shape, and to ensure that we are getting our whole country in shape to face what we are going to have to face. And this is where we need to encourage government and say, be the global leader on this, prove yourselves, show the way, and then bring others with you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't tell you the difference it is to um, know that you're working with a parliament of, of climate believers instead of climate deniers. And yes, there's you know, much work to be done, uh, but there is at least hope that that work will and can be done. Um, so thank you very much for that. And then moving swiftly on, just trying to catch up a little bit of time, um, to, to introduce you to Irene Velez-Torres. As I said, she's the Colombian Consul General in London and a former Minister of Mines and Energy. Between 2022 and 2023, Irene was Minister of Mines and Energy in the first left-wing government of Colombia, leading a vision in the just energy transition to democratise energy access and overcome extractivism. For over 20 years, she has led an activist research agenda on environmental and agrarian conflicts in Colombia and Latin America, examining the intersections with historical processes of ethnic, racial, class, and gender discrimination for Afro-Indigenous and Mestizo communities, if I've said that correctly. I'm sure you'll correct me if I haven't. So very excited now to pass you over to Irene. Thank you. Uh, good night, everyone. Uh, it's, thank you very much for the invitation and for what Global Justice Now is doing uh, for climate justice and for making a possible world where new generations can live and can live in a justice way. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about what does it mean to uh, phase out of fossil fuels from a global south perspective, and particularly from uh, the perspective of a country that has been dependent on the exploitation of uh, fossil fuels and the very intense uh, exports of fossil fuels, especially since the 80s. So I don't think we need to uh, convince you about the importance of taking the decision of uh, doing this phase out. Actually, if anything, I feel that here we have uh, sharing this uh, conversation with the public that is completely convinced of the urgency of taking those decisions. 
but I would like to refer to the false dilemma that President Petro uh, raised when he was in Dubai. So basically what he was saying is there is no dilemma between fossil fuel capital and life. The hegemonic media may present it as one thing or the other. Uh, maybe right-wing populists may present it as one thing or the other. But we know that without life, there is just nothing else, nothing beyond. So we have to take the decision of protecting life, and the questions are how to do that, and how to do that while at the same time you need to continue supporting a national economy that for decades has been dependent on fossil fuels. So in the case of Colombia, it is very special that uh, has decided to support this treaty and is also calling for the importance of having it next to the Paris Agreement. Basically, what we are saying in the government is uh, there is not only the ambition of reducing the emissions, but there should be the, the, the ambition of changing the model. And changing the model is not only adding a green energy into the matrix, but substituting the matrix, the energy matrix, the sources in the energy matrix. And that substitution takes a lot more than adding, because adding will mean to keep the industry, the fossil fuel industry, just intact and, of course, make less enemies, as you can be uh, making if you attempt to substitute. But the idea of substitution really gives us the opportunity of uh, looking into a world that is actually sustainable and uh, can uh, be there for the future generations. Now, if we go and see uh, what are the challenges, then in the case of Colombia, we have this economic dependency, which is not only that our fiscal system, which means all our external debt, depends on selling those very uh, carbon-intensive commodities, but also the local economies are depending in many regions of those industries. So when you go and talk to the communities, even though the communities may have been impacted for years by the oil industries or by the coal mining industries, it's very difficult for those communities to imagine a future a, a way or a future without the industries that have made their lives possible, even if in, in a poor way. So the transition also implies, or the decarbonization is not only of the economies, but also of the imaginations of people. And I think in that perspective, we have still a very long way to go. Because it is, I mean, even if you make the numbers, then going and convince people is another thing. And at the internal level in Colombia, we have had a great resistance to accept what President Petro is being loud saying in international, multinational scenarios. So he can be very well recognized in the United Nations, and, but within the country, and especially with the, let's call them, carbon intensive elites, uh, there, are, there are many, um, there, is, there is a very violent resistance to those ideas. And that's part of how we have to tackle the problem in terms of also dealing with the imagination, with the culture that has been embedded in our economies. And it's also um, making it more challenging to just transition away from a technological or economical perspective. So the uh, just energy transition, as we have called it in the national development plan of this new left-wing government, um, ambition four different aspects or like lines of action in order to uh, make the transition possible. Uh, one is to have a labor transition, because we know that those industries, the carbon intensive industries, employ a lot of people. And with a very, uh, like a, a very um, delayed industrialization in other productive sectors, those extractive industries are actually very well liked by the labor unions, for example. So we need to work with the unions in order for, to imagine with them and to transition with them um, 
to make that uh, labor transition possible. We are also talking about fiscal transitions. And as I said before, it will mean to exchange uh, the model of dependency that we have in relation to the extractive industries. Particularly, uh, President Petro is talking about the exchange of debt for climate action. That is something that goes directly or it talks directly to the international financial system and to the banks and to the governments who have been lending money to the global south. But we have to deal with that because there is no other way in which we can replace the economy that has been built with fossil fuels. The global south, even if we manage to industrialize and to uh, make agriculture more efficient and to grow in all those other productive sectors, we are not going to be able to do it on time. So the big pressure that we have at the internal level is about our own national economies. And in order to deal with that, one crucial aspect is how to deal with external debt. And that debate is a global one. It's a multilateral one. And it deals also with what are the decisions taken in the global north. Because it has been the banks in the global north and the governments in the global north that has, have lent us that money and that have to decide today that we can actually exchange uh, climate action for that debt. Otherwise, it won't be possible for us. A third point of transition or a third line of action is the economic transition, which is basically to create new economies at the local scale, but also at the national scale. In the case of Colombia, we are working very hard in terms of developing a, a tourist industry that hopefully will be also ecological and socially responsible because we know that tourism can also be very impactful at the local level. So trying to balance those two things is difficult, but we are attempting to do that. We are working hardly in uh, developing agriculture, and then we know again that some, especially uh, like large scale agriculture, can be very damaging, can carry a lot of uh, what we call it las mochilas ecologicas, no? So the, the, the water footprint and the ecological footprint that avocado has being eaten here can be bringing from our soil and our rivers. And so we are conscious of that tension, but at the same time, we know that we need to replace the economy and we prefer to have a greener economy, even if in some cases it has to be capitalist. And finally, industrialization. We need to speed up industrialization, particularly Colombia, as compared to other Latin American countries, has a big delay in terms of industrialization, especially if we compare us with Brazil. But uh, hydrogen and green hydrogen represents an opportunity that the government is looking at and taking very seriously. Finally, the fourth line of action that is there as part of the national debate is the ecological transitions. And with that, we mean the decarbonization of local economies and how to imagine these other ways of doing agriculture, for example, agroecology and these uh, more sustainable, locally based uh, productive models. We are looking at remediation, which is something that is very, um, little heard in the international debate. But us who have lived in uh, territories with very deep and very long sustained extractivism know that there is a lot of damage accumulated in those soils, in those rivers. And if we don't uh, deal with that in terms of remediation and restoration of those ecosystems and ecologies, then nothing is going to grow there. I mean, imagine a mine as big, a coal mine as big as Cerrejón being the biggest in the whole Americas. How are we going to grow there anything if that mine has consumed 30% of the whole water around the mine? So there is nothing that can grow there. So the only way to actually imagine and materialize a different economic model uh, facing away that extractivist coal-based model is to think and take seriously uh, remediation and restoration. 
Now, my final point, who's gonna pay for that? Because, I mean, we know that what has to be done, but every time Petro has been there being loud, saying that this is what we have to do, and some other governments that can be greener or more uh, uh, center democratic, where they say yes, 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 until the point is made of financiation. Because the financiation point divides us into like the North is still wanting to accumulate those uh, tax uh, for polluters, those uh, taxes for uh, big capital. They want to keep it for themselves once again. And I'm sorry to say that in, in, in terms of paying, uh, we need to fight a colonial uh, relationship. And if we don't open for that discussion, then solutions are not going to arrive on time, particularly in the Global South. Thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you very much, Irene. I think it's really important to have these positive stories of people leading the way, of whole countries leading the way in having very clear-eyed visions about what's necessary and the ambition to, to see it through. And of course, you know, money and all of those things are going to be hard nuts to crack. But recognising the stakeholders as you have and making sure that you're bringing them all on board and working in partnership, it's definitely important that we can look to those uh, leaders like Colombia and look to see what we're seeking to follow. So, um, leading on nicely from there, our last speaker this evening before we move to questions is Mitzi. Uh, and as has been mentioned by Jenny earlier, Mitzi uh, is a full-time climate justice, act justice activist based in Metro Manila in the Philippines. She's on the steering committee of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty and has been instrumental in pushing this campaign forward since its inception a strong voice on anti-imperialism, anti-colonization, along with Irene, obviously, it moves on very nicely, and the intersectionality of the climate crisis. She's committed to a systematic change and to collectively building a world that prioritizes people and the planet through organizing global solidarity and a collective action approach, which I think we're all here for. So <laughs> I'll pass you over now. Thank you, Mitzi. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me all right? Um, I want to start by saying how I became a climate justice activist. So in growing up in the Philippines, we experienced a lot of extreme weather events, super typhoons mostly, heat waves. And in the past 20 years, the Philippines has had the highest number of extreme weather events, which means that our generation grew up in the climate crisis. But it wasn't until 2017 and I was able to talk to Lumad indigenous leaders and they told us about how they are being harassed and displaced and militarized and killed for defending their ancestral lands. I realized that I needed to become a climate justice activist. When he was explaining their experiences of harassment because they were going up against large scale multinational mining industries attacking their ancestral lands, after all of that, he said something really simple he said, mm, yeah, so that's why we have no choice but to fight back. Then he asked about lunch. Um, it was so simple, and to me, it really burst my bubble of privilege, and I realized, what am I doing? Here I have an illusion of a choice of whether or not I should fight, whether or not I should join and become an activist. When it's really simple, we have no choice but to fight back. And that was my roots of climate justice activism. It has always been rooted in a social justice lens, in a lens that is for peace and for just peace. So after coming away from COP26 in Glasgow, where they spent hours, days, discussing fossil fuel phase out or coal phase out or coal phase down, and debating on this one single word, not realizing that that one word meant millions of people's lives across the world, I came away from that thinking, 
what is the point of these international conferences? And then someone came to me with the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, and they told me that it was patterned after the Landmines Treaty, after the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It was af patterned after peace treaties. And this is something that I resonated with. This is something that I saw, hey, if it's coming from a peace perspective, it, if it's rooted in that, then it will be rooted in justice. And with the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty and with, with what happened with the Landmines Treaty and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation non Treaty, what we had was basically a small group of progressive countries creating the treaty, not in the consensus space, which is how COP is doing it, and that's why countries like the U.S. and big polluters are able to water it down as much as they can. But with the treaty and with the, peace, but with the past treaties, they were able to create something that was actually really good and something, and they were able to do it really quickly, and then they got other countries to sign on. And so that's what we're seeing with the Fossil Fuel Treaty. We're seeing countries mostly from the Pacific and countries like Timor-Leste and Colombia leading the way. And what happens when we have Global South countries who lead the way on climate policies? What happens when we have decolonized climate policies? The 1.5 degrees Celsius limit on the Paris Agreement, that came from African nations. The loss and damage fund, that came from small island development nations and countries like the Philippines. When we have global south countries leading, when we have civil society and activists and people and working class people leading, we actually have change. And that is the beauty of the fossil fuel treaty. You have two parts to it. You have the government side of it and you have the movement side of it. There is a way for the movement to come in and to make sure that the fossil fuel treaty that's being written as a government treaty remains true to its values. And the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty recently released its values, and it focuses on justice, which means it's equitable, enforceable, and post-extractive. Rights, which means that we, we fight for the right to life, the right to health, intergenerational and intersectional rights. Public good, which means energy justice, which means corporate accountability, which means land access, decolonialization, and fixing the international financial architecture. Because as Irina is mentioning, someone needs to pay. And right now, who is paying for the climate crisis? The millions of people across the world who are losing their lives to floods and heat waves. The farmers and fisher folk and the people in the global south and in the global north who aren't able to eat. The people dying because of climate-related health diseases. The environmental defenders going against destructive projects usually funded by or owned by the global north being killed. The people who are in conflict and occupation zones, like in Gaza, because the military and countries are trying to get the gas, coal, and oil in their areas. They're the ones paying for the climate crisis right now. And is that right? Who should pay? It's not the normal people of the global north either. And a lot of right-wing um, um, Leaders will try to make it out like that. Oh, they're your enemies. The migrants are your enemies. The people of color are your enemies. Oh, they're trying to take your hard-earned money. No, who's taking people's hard-earned money? It's the capitalists. It's the, pro the profit, the ones profiteering from the climate crisis. They like to make us think that they have the power. But where does their power come from? It comes from land. It comes from resources. It comes from workers' um, labor. And who really owns that? We do. The collective power of the people. And it is time for us to take it back. And how do we do this? By building coalition, by building movements, by building campaigns. And this is the last day of this tour. And I have seen how strong the people are, how so many worker unions are involved in this campaign, how so many different people from different walks of life, from migrants to diaspora to grandmothers and grandfathers mostly, actually really pouring their life into climate justice work, into pushing for the fossil fuel treaty, because we all understand that what we're really fighting for is life. That is what the fossil fuel treaty is. It is a chance for us to really create a world that is post-extractive, a world that is built on justice, a world that is built on coalition and collaboration. There's a quote that was um, said by Leela Watson, who was a Murray, uh, indigenous activist from Australia that goes, if you have come here to help me, then you are wasting your time. 
But if you have come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. That is what the treaty is. It is a way for us to come together, to work together, and to put pressure on the local level, on the city level, on the national level, on the global level. I think it's such a beautiful thing that you can endorse the treaty as an individual, as an organization, as a student um, union, as a school, and all of that builds up into this movement that's creating that better world that we're fighting for. We often know what we're fighting against. When we say, what are you against? You really go fossil fuel industries, um, colonialization, anti-imperialism. You, know, you really know what words to say. But what are we fighting for? Is that clear in your guys' minds? Is that clear in your hearts? When I ask my mom what she thinks she's fighting for, what she thinks is the most important thing, and one of the happiest moments in her life, she says, it was the day I was born. When I ask school kids, they say, it's the last day of school. <laughs> and essentially, that feeling, that feeling is what climate justice is. We want everyone to have access to food. We want everyone to have access to housing, to clothes, and joy. We want everyone to be able to sing and dance and laugh and reconnect with nature. Because essentially, the crisis that we're in is one that disconnects us from nature, that disconnects us from each other. They want us to be individualized because then we feel powerless. And we say no to that. We build coalitions, we build alliances across the world, we build international solidarity because we know that we are stronger together. We know that our liberations are tied together. I'm just really happy um, because I was at the Shell protest this morning and I was full of anger and, and grief because of the profits of Shell, but also just a lot of joy from the people protesting in front of Shell and really seeing the different kinds of actors, the different kinds of activists that are present in our ecosystem of change makers and how the fossil, fuel, the fossil Fuel Treaty is a home for all of those different kinds. I've met so many different kinds of people endorsing the treaty. There are people who are like really radical and like really doing direct action. And then you have politicians, and then you have students, and then you have celebrities, and you have former presidents. And that really shows me that the treaty is a way for us to come together from different paths of life, to really create something that leaves no one behind because there is space for everyone in this treaty, except for the fossil fuel industry. <laughs> and unlike the COP process, which has been co-opted and flooded by the fossil fuel industry, the fossil fuel treaty will not allow that to happen. We will have a treaty and an agreement that actually addresses the root cause of the emissions. The COP process says they're really important. I don't, I don't want to say that they're not. They're really important. It's complementary to the fossil fuel treaty. But what they do is they focus on the emissions and not the actual source. Where are the emissions coming from? Comes from the fossil fuel industry. And we need to recognize that they are the weapons of destruction of our generation. I will end the speech with one last thing, saying that the only thing that continuously grows and grows and grows in nature is cancer cells. So this fantasy of everlasting growth or growth development product, which isn't even really growth because it's accumulation just for the 1%, is a cancer that is killing us all. And the fossil fuel industry is that cancer, and we must stop it once and for all if we want to survive on this planet. Thank you. Thank you, Mitzi, for... Um, leaving us with that very moving uh, speech and for bringing us back to the fact that the Fossil Fuel Treaty at its core is about justice and joy, 
which I quite like the, <laughs> the neatness of that. So that's um, all of our speakers and how fantastic it is to have such a panel of strong women speaking to us this evening. Um, but now it's your turn uh, to ask some questions. And we've got uh, just over half an hour and then we'll come back for some final words from all of our panelists as well. We'll take the questions sort of three or four at a time and we need volunteers for a volunteer, if you don't mind, for either. Oh no, it looks like we already have volunteers. <laughs> Fantastic. We've got, we've got some of either side. So, yes, if you, if you want to uh, put your hand up, we'll take two or three questions at a time, and then we'll come back to them and I'll hopefully get to ask some more. So, gentleman at the front here. And if you could say who you are. Hi, yeah. I'm John. I met Mitzi this morning at Shell. Um, it was a bit weird for Mitzi because I was dressed up as a vampire. Um, yeah, so the UK Youth Climate Coalition has a case at the International Criminal Court against BP. Part of that case is about reparations, that the uh, board members are to be prosecuted and they, the, they have to pay reparations, the company has to pay reparations. In France, uh, Bloom Association has developed a case against Total Energies and that in due course is expected to go to the International Criminal Court. There are other groups that are developing cases using national and international criminal law to prosecute people who kill, annihilate nations, causing mass suffering. All of those are criminal offences in existing criminal law, um, including the UK. So my point is that if fossil fuel companies and politicians don't budge um, in accordance with the non-proliferation treaty that you're proposing, that we need a deadline and COP30 should be that deadline. And that if you do not agree and sign up to that non-proliferation treaty, at COP30, the demand should be that you will introduce what, uh, that, um, what uh, Greta Thunberg warned of, which was with the cease and desist notice that she issued 20 months ago, that there will be cr criminal prosecutions across the board of politicians and fossil fuel executives, and you will go to prison and you will pay your reparations. So, yeah, your thoughts on that. And if, thank you for that, John. And um, there's a gentleman at the front here, and then a lady at the back in the blue jumper. And again, if you can say who you are, and if, you, if your question is directed at any particular member of the panel, do say so. Otherwise, we'll see who wants to, to pick it up. And if you could make sure there's a question uh, in what you're saying as well, that would be great. My name is John Morris. I'm a member of the Labour Party. I'm also a member of Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. I just wanted to make a very short statement. At the weekend, on behalf of Oxfam, I think three of my colleagues, we counted 80-odd people signing the petition about polluters paying, and it's something that Oxfam is doing very strongly at the present. My question really is to climate justice now. How does carbon capture and nuclear power and generation fit into your campaign. Thank you. Lydia Claire. Hello, my name is Bella and I used to work for climate justice not-for-profits back in Australia. My question is around just transitions for fossil fuel communities and I'm particularly interested in hearing about the work in Colombia and the Philippines. You've talked about how these communities need to transition to new industries or roles, and I'm interested to hear if you've engaged those communities and what roles they're interested in or industries. Thank you. I think we'll just take one more before we go. There's a lady in the in third row there, fourth row. Thank you. My name's Linda Rattigan. Um, my question really is to the MP. In the Paris Agreement, um, governments were supposed to educate their population, and they haven't. So what can the government do to educate our population? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, OK, so maybe if I go for these specific questions, ask the specific people first, and then we can open it up more widely. So. Um, First of all, uh, Linda's question about what the government can do on climate literacy. Um, Rachel, is that, are you okay taking that one? 
Yes, um, thank you for your question. There was actually a bill before the last, um, a private member's bill before the last Parliament around climate education, um, which my colleague Nadia Whittam um, was taking through Parliament. And um, it had a lot of support from the Labour's um, front bench at the time. So obviously now we've got the opportunity to put these things into action and, and very much want to ensure that that happens. I do, however, think it isn't the young people that need educating. I do think it is the politicians. So we might have to extend the franchise around that. Thank you. And then, Izzy, are you okay to answer on uh, Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, briefly, our position is very much that we need renewables, it, we don't need nuclear energy, and we certainly don't need carbon capture. I think it can be used in sort of very specific circumstances, but this way that it's being pitched as essentially a way for the fossil fuel industry to carry on polluting and have a free licence to do that is really dangerous. And it's a new frontier with this government, really, like this massive investment that they've put into carbon capture. And... You know, there's, there's so many different things about it that don't work. I think one thing that is very relevant and really relevant here is this uh, offer to workers. You know, it's quite, it's quite patronising, really. It's a sort of few thousand jobs, and they're sort of talking about this as if it's kind of, you know, a big green jobs offer. And we really need to challenge that, and I think the treaty can be an umbrella for doing that to kind of, like, link up with workers' movements and say, actually, these kind of, like little supposed like mitigation measures that are actually not mitigation measures at all are not the things that are going to provide fairness for workers or for communities um so that's i think something that as a movement we all need to be looking at and it's something certainly that we need to do more on at global justice now but i'd say that's where it fits into our thinking at the moment we, need, we needed more microphones i can see that now <laughs> Okay, so that just leaves the, the, the two questions that, uh, um, from Valor and from John. Uh, and John's was about the criminal prosecutions and the views on if, if there isn't sufficient movement by next year at, at COP30. And then also about the uh, engaging communities and the, in transitions and, and the importance of, of that stakeholder engagement, community engagement and those conversations. So I'm gonna pass it over now uh, maybe to yourself, Irene, and then Mitzi. The federal government made a huge effort in addressing communities, local communities from uh, all around the country. We did more than 200 workshops, as we call it, no? Tajeris, uh, in order to understand what uh, just transition meant for people. And we paid particular and close attention to those areas where uh, extractive industries are operating at the moment and what kind of um, imagination and uh, desire there is. And what I think is the common ground of those communities is that is what they don't want. So I think it's difficult yet to imagine something else, but they are very tired of the extractive model. And what is the extractive model? The extractive model is when a foreign capital that can be a national capital or a transnational capital, but foreign to the local people, when that a foreign to the local people capital comes into a territory, explodes and extracts wherever the commodity is and then leaves leaving only behind the damage, the impoverishment for years, uh, and a very little uh, good uh, life, happy life, joy, uh, and justice for locals. So, uh, for example, when we were talking about the need of developing these new green uh, technologies for en energy generation, so the solar panels or the wind mills, and, so people could be very open to those projects, but what they don't want is for those projects to be the new green extractivism. Mm -hmm. So they are very alert of what does it mean to actually um, go justice. And so I will say green energy, yes, but if it is not extractive. A monocle, uh, like agriculture can be industrialized, but not in the monoculture corporate way. 
Uh, there can be tourism, but not corporate extractivist tourism. And people are, well, like local people and rural people are just, they're being very flexible and very knowledgeable of different sorts of arts and different sorts of and, uh, skills. And, but what, what they are not willing to do anymore is basically colonial and uh, neoliberal extractive uh, uh, yeah, structures. Uh, and I think uh, it's very fair uh, for a government to support that wheel. I want to say I want their government <laughs> that recognizes that we shouldn't have colonial and neoliberal policies because that is not what's happening in the Philippines. Um, but it's exactly the same thing. We need our politicians and our, our policymakers to actually be prioritizing people and planet. What does that mean? It means listening to their farmers, listening to their indigenous peoples, listening to the most marginalized in their communities. And in the Philippines, that's our farmers and our fisher folk um, and our indigenous peoples. And it's similar to what was mentioned where at home, a lot of our um, extraction is actually for critical minerals, for renewable energy. And so that's what we were talking about, how we have to make sure that it's a post-extractive world that we're doing. We're not just doing an energy transition, but really changing the way that we're producing energy, changing how much is being used. And because so much of it is just going into the profit and to create more profit for the 1%. If we also look at the critical minerals, most of the minerals being taken away is actually for um, arms and military and not even for renewable energy. So it's really understanding that. Um, on another sense, as a, from an activist point of view, if engaging with working class communities, it's so incredibly important that we do this as a climate justice movement. The climate crisis, um, the climate crisis amplifies and affects all social injustices, which means that the climate justice movement's duty is to amplify all social justice movements. And by that I mean, we don't go to the worker movement and say, hey, you have to come join us, fight for climate justice. But we go to the workers movement and say, hey, our fight for climate justice means fighting for workers' rights. And then you develop a relationship. And then they start to realize, hey, what are you talking about? Oh, the heat waves? Yeah, we're experiencing that in our factories. Oh, it's a climate justice fight to ask for hazard risk pay, which means that they can get um, compensation for um, not having proper uh, equipment during the heat waves in their factories, which means that during their floods, um, they should be receiving extra pay and they shouldn't be at risk of losing their jobs if they're not able to come because of an extreme weather event. And so that is understanding that that's why we need to have workers, farmers, and the most marginalized voices in our discussions around climate justice because they know how the climate crisis is affecting them. And so they know most of the time how to solve it. We don't have to go in there and say, hey, this is how you solve your problem. They often have their own ideas. We just have different languages and different words for it because they don't use the same climate jargon that we do. Um, and on the idea of... of uh, uh, litigation cases, I think it's an extremely powerful tool to use whenever you're able to use it. We need to start exposing the fossil fuel industry as the criminals that they are. And we need to use this and use every tool that we can to do this. And litigation cases are an extremely powerful tool to do that. Thank you. So before I move on and take new questions, is there anybody who wanted to speak on any of the other questions before? I just want to add really quickly, carbon capture and nuclear energy are false solutions, and we really need to focus on that also, um, because they're making that the solution, because that is how they can keep profiteering, that is how they can keep doing what they're doing, and that's why we need to talk about the production and the source and not just the emissions. Because if you talk about the emissions, then we can talk about carbon capture. But we need to talk about who is really causing the climate crisis and it's the fossil fuel industry. Can I just say something about the reparations and the legal cases, obviously. I think the whole conversation that happened around Commonwealth countries talking about reparations and Keir Starmer's response goes to show that we cannot leave these things to governments and legal cases are a really powerful tool for dealing with that. And you know, I think, I think the more of them we can do, the better. I love taking the government's call. I'm game. Let's, let's do more, you know. <laughs> COP30 sounds like a good deadline to me. But, yeah, I think definitely we need to see that conversation as something that's fully in our hands and, you know, not 
something that we can trust governments to do at all. So legal cases are a tool to do that. Great. So we have time for an, at least one more bundle of questions before we come back for final words. Can I take the, the lady in the black top there? Thank you so much for organising this tonight and thank you to all the speakers. Um, my name is Laura Louise Ferdy. I'm uh, from Save the Children UK and I'm also with the Green Party in Hackney. Um, my question is about politics and I just want to sort of um, express my um, d deep disappointment and, and fear with our Labour government but also extend deep respect to our MP on the panel today, Rachel. Uh, for being here and for being an advocate for um, the treaty. And I guess my question is, it feels like this can't succeed if we don't have government backing it, behind it. Um, and when our current government is, is taking donations from fossil fuel extraction, is investing 22 billion in carbon capture, these sort of false solutions, and, and just pushing growth, 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 um, my question would be, how would you, as a, as a Labour MP who clearly sort of shares values with so many of us, advocate from within when the leadership within Parliament is part of the system that we're trying to change and dismantle? Is it ever, are we, do we ever stand a chance with this government with, with, with love and respect? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. And uh, there's a gentleman in the second row here. Yeah, hi, I'm Mike Hope. I, I, in a way, I want to d approach the same question from a, a, another direction. There was a question earlier uh, saying, you know, how can we get governments to educate the people? I'd say, how do we get, how do we enable people to educate governments who like to think that they you know, they get all the information they need from lobbyists, from corporates, from arms industries, mm -hmm. from warmongers, from Zionists, dare I say. They like to shut down any alternative viewpoint. They manipulate the media. The media self-censors. The Guardian newspaper is, you know, itself, you know, I don't know about George Monbiot, but um, it has been guilty of some incredible um, travesties of justice, all the while, while reporters are being arrested. That's in this country. We have had several under this government. So how do we break through? How do we get them to listen? And how do we convince them that uh, they cannot go against us? They have to listen to us. That's the big question. Thank you. Then there's a lady near the back of this side with her hand up. And I think we'll have one more after that, the gentleman in the white shirt in the back of the fourth row. He's had his hand up for a while, so. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Marilla of um, Global Justice Hearts and Beds. Um, I would just like to thank all of the panel. You were both, you were all incredibly moving speakers. Um, I just wanted to um, link up um, some things I've been reading in the latest issue of Think Global, which is the Global Justice Now magazine. Um, it was so inspiring to hear um, Irene from Colombia talk about um, how um, the president wants to move the country away from fossil fuels despite you know, such a legacy of being kind of dependent on them financially. Um, and yet, you know, if Colombia is willing to make that um, green transition, then, you know, what excuse has the rest of the world got, really? Um, I was also reading in Think Global that, you know, in addition to all of these financial challenges in Colombia where everyone thinks it's a good idea, but no one's coming up with the money. In addition to that, Colombia is being sued through corporate courts due to being part of trade deals. And Global Justice Now is um, 
pushing now that the trade deal is not renewed in a way that includes ISDS or corporate courts. So I suppose my question to um, Rachel, who's an MP, is um, if we go and see our MPs, um, I, I don't know if there is a, an answer or whether every MP is different, but if someone came with lots of demands, so, you know, sign up to the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty and push to drop the treaties with ISDS in, and then here are all the other environmental and social justice concerns we've got as well. Is that kind of too much in one meeting, or do you encourage people to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to raise several issues that are linked like this? Thank you. Hi, I'm Mick Lacey. I'm going to register a bit of a disagreement with some that's been said. Um, the situation is so dire, so urgent, and the graph's rising so steeply that I think it is wrong to dismiss out of hand anything that might contribute even a small way in this. Uh, in other words, things like the retrieving of carbon, methane and so on from the atmosphere, preventing it from getting into the atmosphere where it's going to happen anyway. Um, the idea of carbon capture is one variant on that. Uh, it shouldn't be dismissed. Uh, it won't happen through giving vast billions away to oil companies, but it's the sort of thing where there are inspired uh, engineers and technicians and uh, scientists in small laboratories scattered around who are going to try ideas, other ideas, they'll work on it, and uh, there may be solutions there. And it shouldn't be sort of brushed aside before they're given their chance. Um, the uh, nuclear, it's continuous, whereas both wind and solar are very time dependent. Uh, solar panels only give an output out between about 10 o'clock in the morning and 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, these, any ideas at all that contribute even a small amount should be allowed to trickle on where, where there's chance of uh, something happening. As an example, recently I saw that um, uh, Toyota have uh, developed a small cartridge, relatively small cartridge, that can be used to uh, put hydrogen into vehicles. Uh, we need hydrogen, not through pipes, which is going to leak from, but we need hydrogen for cooking. We need gas, hydrogen gas, for cooking. And uh, it's, it's an idea. Try it out. Don't just dismiss it and say, no, this isn't going to work, that isn't going to work. Everything needs to be tried. OK, thank you. So, all good questions there, a couple of which sort of were coalescing around a, a similar idea of how we cut through, compete against lobbyists, make the best of any access we have, but also any advice uh, about how best, to, how best to do that, really. Thank you so much for your questions. And yes, the lobbyists are there. They will be at COP um, next week they are always in that political space trying to buy their way in mm -hmm. and we have to just say that is a reality but i have to question where is the power and that is the big thing we've got to ask if you think this government is in power with just 34 percent of the electorate vote the power sits with the people the power sits with all of us and we have got the opportunity to bring about change. So just put your minds into your community itself. Who holds the power there? Is it a single MP? Or is it all of you who see this crisis, not just coming over the horizon here and now, and want to act? And if that is the case, who are all of those agents? You've got the charities in your communities. You've got the churches and the mosques in your community. You've got uh, the, the public sector bodies. You've got the teachers. You've got the unions. You've got the children. Wow, what powerful voices they've got. Well, get them together. Get your politician in the room and make them sign the treaty. 
And if they don't, then you build the pressure. You build the collaborations. Get those other organisations. Get the children to sign the treaty. Get this in the media. Build your civil society around that because we need a movement. And therefore, everything is possible. Don't ever think it isn't because you have power. Don't give your power away. Hold it, join it together, amplify it, use it and make things happen. That's how politics works. I just want to say the same thing really, is organize, get organized, join an organization, join a union, that collective action is needed. What we're seeing in the Philippines and across the world is that they will try to repress you and silence you because they are afraid of you. They do not want you to speak out and they do not want you to talk to other people because they know that what you're saying is a threat to their power. And so in a twisted way, it is a sign that things are changing. When they're greenwashing and they're starting to lie, in a twisted way, it is a sign that things are changing. Because before the fossil fuel industry flat out just tried to say it's, it's not true, it's not real, it doesn't exist. And now they're saying, hey, look, we're, we're green, we're renewable. So it's, we're getting there. It's, it's really slow, but we are getting there. And exactly as, as, oops, <laughs> as was mentioned already, we just have to keep going. We just have to keep taking that power. Um, and to the comment earlier, I just want to add also that, yes, the Global South is dependent on fossil fuels, but we also have to remember that it's dependent on fossil fuels because of the colonizers and the Global North. If we look at what the colonizer systems have been set up, they set us up to be import dependent and export oriented. And they have kept us that way. They take the minerals that we should be using to, for our industries and bring it into the global north and then sell back those same things to us at twice, thrice, four times the price. And using our labor or another global south country's labor which with very cheap and very um, low workers' human rights. Um, I also want to add that if we look at um, climate policy is being blocked. It's the colonizer in the global north that has been blocking finance, especially to the global south, especially the ones in the forms of grants and not loans. And they have kept us in debt traps, in debt traps bringing us loans, or if it's aid, it comes with neoliberal trade policies. And so the system that we're in where the global south is trapped on the fossil fuel industry is because the global north has set us up that way, so they can keep selling the fossil fuels to us. Um, and that's just a really important reminder. Um, yeah. So the, I think it's a, 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 going to be a good time to bring in um, Kush in a moment, in a moment, <laughs> from Fossil Free London, because I think that really speaks to what we can, going to be speaking to what we can do, particularly in this room. So hold on to that thought, but I just realised there's one question that we haven't answered, but I'm sure you all have um, something to say, which is the importance of the plurality of the things that can be used, and maybe talk uh, about where we put our money, how much of it we put where, why we're perhaps spending all of our money in one area instead of the plurality of all the solutions that are going to be required. And I think there is an acceptance, that, you know, as, as you were talking about, Izzy, that there is a place for uh, various solutions, but that the, the importance is likely to be about how much is spent where, why we're choosing to spend money on things that may not be there in time, that are going to create as many problems as they might solve. Um, and I wondered if anyone had any particular thoughts on, on some of those issues that were, were spoken about, about the different solutions out there that we need to be looking to? Um, yeah, I can. Uh, so I think one thing to say about these is, yeah, as Michelle said, you know, we, there are certain situations, you know, certain specific situations in which carbon capture and things like that might be useful. But we talk a lot, I think, in the climate movement about dangerous distractions and carbon capture. The idea that carbon capture can solve the crisis has become a dangerous distra distraction. Um, it's being used in place of actually finding fair and just solutions and ways for us all to be powered by renewable energy. And I think where you were talking about the kind of intellectual resource and technical resource and capacity that's going into this, that could be directed elsewhere to solutions that are more long term and will actually bring about not just an energy transition to bring us back from the brink of this crisis, but also a just and fair transition that alleviates inequality rather than entrenching it. And 
because I think even if carbon capture technically you know, works to reduce emissions, it's still going to leave the fossil fuel industry with a huge amount of power. And this is what we have to challenge and we have to fight because otherwise we're still just going to be living in an incredibly unjust world. Maybe it will be more sustainable, but that's, I don't think that's really the world that we're really fighting for here. I also, oh. I also want to add that we do have carbon capture and storage that does work the trees, the oceans, and what we need is restoration. What we need is to ensure that these things that we know works really well and has worked well for so long needs to get back to its original state, needs to make sure that we reconnect with that nature and we bring that back and at the same time industrialize and see how we can use science and technology to make sure that nature becomes restored. They're not two different things. But we need to say and look at who is controlling where science and research is going to right now. It's the big, it's the big fossil fuel industries, it's the big capitalists, it's the big multinational corporations that do not want to fund the things that will stop them. And so we really need to pay attention to that detail of who is directing research and science right now. Shall I just pick up the point that Marilla um, was raising about how much can an MP hold in their head at any one time? Um, what, what I would say is um, keep going back and seeing your MP. We've got an incredible access in our country to MPs. Go through those doors and push and see how far you can get. When the eyes start rolling, that's the time to stop. But just a little bit of advice. Keep things short, keep things really simple. Always go with an action and always check up that they've followed through on what they've committed to. And that's how you make progress. That's, that's definitely going to be a good time to bring in uh, Kush to speak from Fossil Free London. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kush. I'm from Fossil Free London. Um, so, yeah, thank you to all of our, our speakers and panelists and uh, Global Justice Now for putting on uh, today's event. But I kind of wanted to tell you uh, a little bit more about what you can do after this event. Um, so London's a bit of a weird place because, as um, Izzy mentioned, like, you know, we've actually got quite a progressive mayor who has signed up to the Fossil, fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And yet at the same time, Shell moved its headquarters to London a few years ago because London's a great city for fossil fuel companies to do business in. We have some of the biggest uh, law firms who facilitate loads of contracts for fossil fuel companies here. We have loads of banks and insurers um, and fossil fuel companies themselves. It's not just Shell, we've also got BP and others. So as a resident of this city, you have a lot of power in resisting that industry. Um, and that is what Fossil Free London does. So we meet up in person. Um, there's usually at least two meetings a week. You don't have to come to all of them. But we do lots of different themes of work. Some of them are directly targeting the fossil fuel industry. Some of them are targeting finances. Um, and some of it is also to, to do with actually trying to reimagine London. Um, so we have loads of stuff like walking tours, book clubs. Um, and, but a lot of it is direct action. So going to the places where the fossil fuel industry is hosting its meetings or is trying to recruit new people to go and work for it or is going on other panel events talking about their um, corporate social responsibility. And we just go there and tell the truth. Sometimes it's going into the meetings itself and just standing up and just calling out their lies. Uh, other times it's standing outside and saying, no, this is like bullshit, like <laughs> don't, don't attend this. Um, so you can find out more by visiting fossilfreelondon.org um, or grab one of our flyers. We've got QR codes for welcome talks that also happen, I think, once or twice a week. Um, or if, you know, you're really too busy, then you can so follow us on social media. I think we're on Instagram and Facebook and, and Twitter and all of those sorts of things. Um, and sadly, we can't offer you a free book when you join, but it is free to join. Um, uh, but you can get loads of stickers. So grab loads of stickers from the back and stick them onto everything. Thank you so much.
with them now we hope that each member of the panel get their couple of minutes just for final words from each of them. I'm sure you'll want to hear it. Um, so I'm going to start off with Izzy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll keep it really brief and just summarise what a lot of people, and especially Rachel as well, has been talking about here tonight, that you know, so much of this campaign, Mitzi said it too, is about community organising. There's a side of this that's about government and there's a side of this that's about movement building. And the more of you that can get involved in this, the more powerful it will be. So please do speak to my colleagues at the back about how you can get involved in loads of dis different aspects of getting endorsements for the Fossil Fuel Treaty from lots of different constituencies, including your MP, your local councils. This is how we will build pressure. The process is important, is as important as the result because it's about building consensus around a globally just transition and creating a fairer world. And please do, if you, if you are able to, join Global Justice Now so that we can continue our work pushing for global justice across a whole range of issues. Thank you. There's been an incredible discussion tonight, and thank you for your questions and your thoughts, even if you weren't able to have time to express them. But we've got a year before that critical conference takes place, and a lot can happen in a year. A lot can happen in politics, and a lot can happen on the ground. But it will only happen if you make it happen. And that's my ask of you, is not to give up on hope, because the moment you give up on hope, you'll give up on the planet. So you, it's in your hands, the future of this planet, as much as it's in my hands and all of our hands. But if we join our hands together and march together and fight together, anything can happen. Um, I think we cannot leave this room without thinking and empathizing with uh, who are today suffering genocide. And I am bringing this um, <laughs> reflection because securitizing fossil fuels and energy has been responsible of local, subnational, and transnational wars forever. Uh, so we need to think critically about those connections, and we have to realize that by supporting this kind of treaty, we are also supporting being loud and being vocal for the need to continue fighting for peace. And I think this is like something that we have to embrace uh, together. And finally, Mitzi. To add to that note, in 2023, military expenditure surged to 2.44 trillion US dollars. That is money that could have gone to social services, to health, to education, to climate action and climate justice across the world. And yet these countries say they don't have money for climate action. They don't have money for health care. They don't have money for workers' rights. Enough is enough. We need to educate, agitate, and organize and get your leaders to sign on to the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Thank you. So thank you all. Um, it's been such an inspiring evening. And I, you know, we can tell, can't we, from, from the responses that we've had that everyone has uh, felt inspired by the things they've heard. And thank you all for your participation as well. Um, and you know what you've got to do. You've got to go out there and speak to your MPs. You've got to contact your organisations. You've got to make yourself heard. And as Rachel says, it's in our hands to go out there and make it happen. And we can you know, do that together in all the organisations that we're... I'm sure we're all in multiple organisations in our volunteer work and our, our, our day jobs as well. So it's up to us, it's in our hands, and I'd like you to join with me in saying a huge thanks to our inspiring speakers. This evening. <laughs>